Thank you, Professor uh, Miroslav Kokur, for giving me this opportunity to make a presentation on the society and culture of my state. The title of my presentation is Kerala Society and Culture, a Retrospect. The geographical position of Kerala has its own advantage and disadvantage. As I have shown the map of Kerala, you can see that we have, we are on the southernmost part of the Indian Peninsula, with Western Ghats on the east and the Arabian Sea on the west. Kerala has often been praised, acclaimed by even the United Nations in terms of its high human development index. I would probably attempt a critique of the projected Kerala model in my presentation. It is true that we have high rate of literacy. We are advanced in terms of health. Our society marks the low rate of infant mortality and the life expectancy is as high as above 70 years. So naturally, Kerala is projected as progressive, secular, modern, and democratic. But it has its own paradoxes and black spots in the projected images, which is what I would like to present. Let me begin with a quote from Eric Hobsbawm. We cannot help situating ourselves in the continuum of our own life. We cannot help comparing past and present. We cannot help learning from it, for that is what experience means. The earliest inhabitants of Kerala, the indigenous people, were Adi Dravidians, who lived here before Indus Valley people. Historians and anthropologists agree that Keralites were a mixture of Adi Dravidians, Dravidians, and Mediterraneans. They also point out the similarities in terms of their body structure. Racially speaking, we are a mixture of Negritoid, proto astraloid and Mediterranean. Earliest evidence of the spiritual expressions of the original inhabitants of Kerala is seen in Erical Caves in Wayanad, the hilly district of Kerala. I'll show you a picture of the rock and graves. You can watch it. This shows similarity with the people who lived in Chendurni Mala near Tenmala in Kollam. Also, Tavri in Idugi district. And these three are the earliest records of the cultural or ritual expressions of the early inhabitants of Kerala. I have seen, I am showing the pictures of rock engravings of Arakal and Tavari. Those hunter-gatherers in the course of time practiced slash and burn cultivation and later led to settlement and agriculture. Their ritual and cultural performances were associated with their life and experiences. To speak about the religion, these people had no institutionalized religion. They did not believe in anthropomorphic gods or deities. They were Ajivaks, Sramanas. They believed in nature, tree, serpent, and worshipped all natural objects. They were also spirit worshippers and ancestor worshippers. Kerala was a part of Tamiragam during the Sangam age, 3 BC to 3 AD. Kerala traces its non-historic cultural genesis to its membership in a vaguely defined historical region known as Tamiragam, a land defined by a common Tamil culture and encompassing the Chera, Chola, Pandya and Ai kingdoms. The antiquity of the megalithic culture of Kerala and its relations with other cultures have been proved. As Kerala Megalics show a close resemblance with those of the Deccan. Scholars suggest an iron-using people 
from the south as its makers. Anthropologists suggest that the megalithic builders were a people of Mediterranean origin who came to the west coast by sea, entered south, and spread northward. The topographical or geographical divisions existed during the Sangam period was called Ain Dine, meaning five divisions on the topography, Kurinji, Mullai, Marudam, Palai, and Nidil. People were divided based on their occupations, not based on caste. These divisions were not rigid, it was flexible, they could change their caste names as and when they moved from one space to another. Tribal chiefs ruled the various kingdoms during the period. They were all Dravidian kings, Cheras, Cholas, Pandyas, and I rules. Of course, there were rivalries among themselves, and the, there was wars often between these rulers. There were also evidences of Buddhism and Jainism, Shaivism and Vaishnavism during the Sangam age. The social, cultural, political nature of the Sangam period is evidenced by the rich cultural tradition of indigenous inhabitants. Their spirituality, orality, songs, dances, rituals, performances, as I said earlier, were gradually being incorporated into Hindu cultural expressions. Since the disintegration of the Chara kingdom around 12th century, of course there are differences of opinion among the historians, since the disintegration of Chara kingdom in the 12th century, which has coincided with the Cheraman Le Perumal legend, the Cheraman Perumal legend says that the last Perumal, Cheraman, partitioned this country and thereafter proceeded to Mecca to embrace Islam. In fact, the weak central authority of Cheras was replaced by the stable local authority of the Nadu Wari's local rulers, who became the center of the new agrarian order. Administration during the period. The administrative setup of the Perumals was in conformity with the classical Hindu political style. The inscriptions of the time provide valuable evidence of the administration. Monarchy was the prevailing form of government. The Perumal was the head of the administrative hierarchy. The advent of the Nambudaris since the first AD and resulted in the introduction of caste system. Earlier, as I said during the Sangam age, there were division of people based on their occupation or based on Varnas, which was not rigid, flexible, but since the consolidation of the Brahminic supremacy in Kerala around 10th to 12th century AD, there was a consolidation of the caste system for the first time in the history of Kerala culture. So their supremacy, the Nambudri supremacy, was carried out in a subtle manner, not by the force of arms, but by the art of peace an advanced alien culture finally swept away the old tribal society. Caste system in Kerala became more rigid and violent in comparison with North India. The geographical features of Kerala, full of mountains and rivers, and so various communities were forced to live in close proximity. This explains why Brahmins in Kerala enforced harsh rules to distance themselves from the lower caste and untouchables. They enforced strict penal codes, unequal laws based on Smritis, Srutis and Manu. Accepting the Brahmins from harsh punishment was ensured. Even for killing, Brahmins were not given any harsh punishment. They can only be fined whereas others were severely punished, even killed for minor offenses. Brahmins exercised control over women's sexuality, the practice of Sambandham, the practice of Brahmin males marrying or having marital relationship with the Nair women. 
this practice of sambandham enabled them to have control over women sexuality brahmins were judges in cases related to actions against caste norms so we can imagine what would have happened there were violent confrontations between hindus and the shramanas ajivaks and the most famous and the most noted in the history of the war between ideology was the between the shankara and his advaita philosophy and the shramana philosophy led by ajivaks jains and buddhists the totem of potentheim gives us examples is an instance of how the untouchables countered the philosophy of shankara's advaita the buddhist and jainist who have been inhabiting kerala since 3rd century bc were forced to flee many of them were murdered and places of shramana worship are now converted into hindu place of worship but the brahmins unlike in north india incorporated shaivites and vaishnavites in kerala in order to maintain hegemony and control the nambudris divided themselves as priestly caste rulers martial like kshatriyas and all others as sudras indigenous people ex buddhist untouchables jainist were all forced to be the lowest in the caste order and is considered untouchable the fifth caste or panchamas it was a period of theocratic feudalism land ownership by the jainis or brahmins and feudal system the hierarchy of the society during that time was kings at the top and then nadwaris or land owners jainis and then kudians or tenant farmers then adians or landless peasants slaves and most of the untouchables were slaves we have the history of slavery in india i'll come to that later formation of nadus and surubams the age of surubams and nadwaris comprising the middle ages of kerala 1100 to 1800 ad began with the disintegration of the second chera kingdom the age witnesses the emergence of localized rulers of different nadus and their original families known as surubams the chera inscriptions mention a few such nadwaris the political scene of kerala was dominated by these local chieftains from 14th to 18th century ad kolathu nadu that is kolathiri nadirippu ruled by zamudri perumbadappu perumbadappu sorry perumbadappu surubam ruled by kochi the headquarters at kochi vanad surubam the headquarters tiruvadankur the most important of such nadus were vanad kochi kolikod and kolathanad these chieftains had important positions in the newly introduced system of government the rule of nadu warriors marked the end of kerala as a politically unified state the nadu warriors and surubams exerted a powerful influence in the newly emerged polity during the period the nambudris ruled the entire society and temple was the center of administration the entire land was divided brahmasam or devasam and the control was with the nambudris brahmins had control or sorry the nambudris had control over almost everything land economy law politics it was a period of cultural colonization it was this period that we had the consolidation of what we call hindu culture in its embryonic form the strategies used by the dominant community are many one of the major things is that bringing up a legend of kerala ulpatti which is just a fiction but propagated as history in which they claim that the entire land of kerala was given to them by parasurama the legendary character and that is how they had claimed to this land through the knowledge of vedas and sanskrit and meteorology and the use of effective use of iron and knowledge of astronomy somehow these nambudris could control the entire economy society and culture and they also introduced 
the idea of purity and pollution to the society of Kerala. The emergence of a Brahmin settlement signified the growth of a new society based on exploitative social relations. Brahmin settlement emerged with the help of Naduwari, who gave them lands and settled them. Because they also propagated the myth that by donating lands to the Nambodaris, the kings will get admission to heaven. So they considered it as a boon. So Naduwari's weighed with each other in donating lands to the Nambodaris. This is the strategy through which they acquired consolidation of their land. As I said, in the history of Kerala society and culture, the influence of Brahmins or Hinduism is a major event. The social cultural sphere was marked by the introduction of the caste system and the incorporation of indigenous cultural practices and Hinduization of these cultural practices. In the political field, there was absolute power rest with the Nambudris. Economy and temple was the center of administration. Regarding the other influences on Kerala culture, we have Buddhism, Jainism, Christians and Jews, Arabs who were here from 12th to 13th century, Europeans like Portuguese, Dutch, British. We also had Muslims invasion from Karnataka. I will come to that later. In 1950s, the formation of Kerala state happened. Kerala state was formed based on the language that is Malayalam. It was based on the linguistic reorganization of the Indian states. So right in 1950s, we became a state. The culture of Kerala is a synthesis of Aryan and Dravidian cultures. We also had traces of Buddhism, Jainism, Jews, Christian, Muslim, developed over centuries. Modern Kerala society took shape owing to migrations from different parts of India and abroad throughout classical antiquity. The culture of Kerala evolved through Sanskritization of the Dravidian indigenous ethos, revivalism of religious movements, missionary activities, reform movements against caste discrimination. Kerala showcases a culture unique to itself, developed through accommodation, acculturation, and assimilation of various faculties of civilized lifestyle. As I said, Kerala is known for its reform movements, begin from the early 19th, late 19th century to early 20th century, up to the middle of the 20th century. Reformation movement in Kerala refers to socio-cultural movement that began towards the end of 19th century and led to a large-scale changes in the social outlook of Indian state of Kerala. Let us go to the background of how this reformation was responsible for bringing a large-scale change in the cultural situation of Kerala. It has its roots in the contestations of caste hegemony, started even in late 19th century. The lit oralities like Puma, the Panamai, Potentayam, as I already referred to my previous uh, presentation, has evidences of how the lit orality, the lit myths, legends of Thayams, are instances of contestations of caste hegemony. The legend or myth of Muttapandeyam, Pulimaranya Tondachan or Vishnamurti are instances. I'm afraid I don't have time to expatiate upon it. In literature also, we can see the foundations of social change in Kerala. It can be traced at least as back as to 16th century. The formation of Malayalam language in its modern form and the development of Bhakti movement under the influence of others like Thunjath Eritachan helped break the monopoly of the Brahmins over literature and knowledge. The arrival of missionaries from the European nations led to a rise in educational institutions in Kerala. It has provided increased employment opportunities 
opportunity to change caste occupation, which is a significant turning point in the history of cultural uh, Kerala culture, and the rise of an educated class among caste groups, especially like Iravas. Another significant stage in the cultural social development of Kerala is anti-slavery struggles. It was recorded that Kerala had 1,65,000 slaves in 1847. They were owned by government and by the feudal landlords. We have evidence of this in Therisapalli records, AD 849, and Barbosa's records, who visited Kerala in 1505. In 1792, the order of a Malabar commissioner prohibited the selling and buying of slaves. The proclamation of Rani Lakshmi Bai of Travangore in 1811 abolishing slavery was only due to the compulsion of the one Colonel Monroe, the British administrator. Due to the above-mentioned proclamation, about 1,36,000 Arab slaves were set free. But it may also be noted that even in this proclamation, the Dalits were not allowed to free themselves as slaves. They were exempted from this proclamation. Consequent on the abolition of slavery in Britain in 1843, in 1862, slavery was prohibited in India as part of Indian Penal Code. Even when slavery was banned by princely government, the Dalit's lives had no effect on it. They continued as slaves because slave caste of Pariyar, Pulayar, Kuravar, Pallar, and Malayar were not set free. This proclamation is a milestone in Kerala social history. But the Iravas found freedom through this proclamation and the Dalits remain slaves. It is after half a century, that is in 1853, that the Dalits' untouchable caste got freedom through a proclamation. The contribution of missionaries in this regard is very, very significant. They freed Dalit laborers who were treated as slaves, who were paid no wages, no food, and even those who attempted to escape were found out and beaten and even killed. Another significant event which contributed, which had influenced Kerala's social cultural history is the Mysorean invasion of Kerala. It shook the hold of elite Brahmins, Nambudris and Nayas. The Mysoreans had scant regard for caste structures in Kerala, and many Brahmin and Nayar families had to flee to southern Kerala to avoid persecution by Mysorean forces. It was a terrible blow to the Nambudri Nair hegemony in Kerala because Tipu proclaimed, I quote, Nair should not carry sword, quote unquote. Do not bow before the Nairs, he proclaimed to all other caste. It is Tipu who introduced the first land survey system in Malabar. He made settlement between agricultural laborers and not with the Jinmis for the first time in the history of India. This resulted in large-scale conversion of Dalits. Many of the Cherumars, the Dalits, were converted to Muslim to escape the persecu persecution from the upper caste. So the statistics says that the Dalit population decreased from 9909 in 1871 as per the first census, to 64,715 in 1881. Though the rate of population during that time was increasing at 5.71 percentage. This statistic shows that there has been a large-scale conversion from Muslim, well, Jalit population to Islam. In contrast with North India, the Enlightenment or Reformation in Kerala was driven by lower caste. In North, North India, we have Raja Ramohan Roy, we have other Arya Samaj, Brahma Samaj, Dayananda Saraswati, etc., which were, of course, led by upper caste. But now in Kerala, we have the Reformation, which has 
pioneered and led by lower caste leaders. For example, we have Narayana Guru, Ayengali, Pagil, Yohannan, etc., who belong to the caste groups which are considered lower in the social settings of 19th century Kerala. Hence, most of them emphasized on the need for abolition of caste system rather than reformation of caste. This is a significant change in the history of Kerala. Let me also point out certain major movements which had major influence on the social and cultural sphere of Kerala. Social movement. The Sri Narayana Guru formed the Sri Narayana Dharma Paribalana Sangam in 1903. Of course, Sri Narayana Guru's ideology was influenced by his own gurus like Vaigunda Swamigal and Chattambi Swamigal. He was also influenced by the Siddha philosophy, Advaita philosophy, also inspired by the ideals of foreign missionaries and also by Hindu Vedic ideology. The next significant movement was PRDS, Pratyaksha Rasha Deva Sabha, started in 1909 by Pogail Yohannan. Before that, Ayankali started Sadhu Jana Parivalan Sangam in 1907. National, sorry, Nair Service Society was established in 1915 by Mandatu Patmanabha Pillai, which is also a continuation of the Malayali Sabha and Malayali Memorial, started in 1885 and 1891. There was also Irava Memorial started in 1896 by Iravas, that is other backward communities in caste. There was also Misra Bojana Sangam started by Sahodran Ayyappan, who began as a follower of Srinarana Guru, but later turned more to Buddhism than to any other established religions. He was an atheist and as a social revolutionary who first time argued for intercaste marriage and he said no religion, no caste, no God. Nambudri Yuvajana Sangam was established in 1919 and which is a continuation of Yoga Shema Sabha and the efforts of VT Bhattadiri Pad in this regard is already been recorded in the social history of Kerala. Major events during the period First, of course, is Chana Revolt, 1813 to 1859. Chana Revolt is the revolt by the Polaya converts to Christianity who were prohibited from covering their upper part of the body. They were not allowed to cover their breast. So the Christian converts from the Polaya community, inspired by the missionary ideals of modernity, continued to struggle for their right to cover the upper part of the body, which is a major event in the history, which is also called breast cloth struggle. It involved not only the issue of feminine modesty, but also the struggle around jadi. Wearing upper cloth would signify the symbolic equality of chanars with upper caste nayas. The ruler of Tiruvidangur conceded the demand for feminine modesty, but refused to allow this specific mode of addressing that implied the symbolic equality chanars with the Nayas. Though the Chanar revolt achieved the right to wear upper cloth and negotiated with the Hindu dominant, the untouchable caste woman had to wait for another decade to achieve the right to cover their bodies. The missionaries unfortunately kept silent about the modesty of lower caste women though they fought vehemently for the Christian converted women. The Arivipuram consecration by Sri Narayana Guru is another significant moment. It happened in 1888. He established his own deity called Shivan. And when the upper caste critiqued him, why do you consecrate Shivan? He said, this is my Shivan, this is Irava Shivan. He also consecrated a mirror to challenge the hegemony of the upper caste form of worship. So the Arivipuram consecration of Narayana Guru is also another significant moment in the social history, the cultural history of Kerala. Another very significant movement was the Villu Vandi agitation led by Ayengali in 1893. At a time when the Dalits, lower caste, were not allowed to use the public paths, even public roads, he protested against this by traveling 
on the public road in a bullock cart that is called Villu Vandi against the denial of access to public road. Let us remember that this happened 34 years before Ambedkar's Mahat March. Ambedkar marched along with his followers for the right to use water from the public Saudar tank in 1927. But Ayengale's Villivandi agitation happened in 1893. The historic passion struggle, which again Ayengali led in 1907 and 1908, again happened a decade before the Russian Revolution. That was in protest against the, against the, uh, the, the upper caste who denied admission for the lit girls in the schools. It lasted more than 100 days. It was the first time in the history of the Passion struggle that the Janmis were made to suffer by the toiling classes. Because when they refused to work in the fields, the Brahmins had no produce and they had to starve. So that is the strategy adopted by Ayengali at, as early as 1907. Another significant movement in the social cultural history of Kerala is Kallumala agitation, which is also called Perinad revolt, which happened in 1915. Of course, the missionary activities were primarily responsible for introducing the idea of modernity, equality, justice, and citizenship among the Dalits in Kerala as a part of their missionary activities. Dr. Sandal Mohan, who had done extensive research on the missionary activities in Kerala, has this to point out. He says, in the light of the missionary documents, we see that one major site where the question of equality were articulated forcefully was a struggle for resources that included land, employment, and modern education. In the case of lower caste, honor, social dignity, and the recognition, individual worth were of great significance. These were necessary for them to surpass the state of abjection in which they lived for centuries. The 20th century lower caste social movements actually carried forward the struggle for securing social equality. Yet another significant movement in the social history of Kerala is the burning of Bible by Poigil Yohanan. Poigil Yohanan, who was a Polaya convert to Christianity, has to react against the caste discrimination in Christianity because the converted Christians were treated separately as untouchables. So he led his own struggle against the Christianity by preaching the real Bible. And he read Bible and explained to his people, this is what Bible said, but this is what is practiced. And do you need this Bible? And the people said no. And so around the, uh, around the gathering of converted Christians, he burned the Bible, which was again another historic moment in the history of cultural movement in Kerala. 1924, there is a Vaikam Satyagraha, and then later on, Guruvayur Satyagraha in 1931 and 32, and in 1936, there is Temple Henry Proclamation. Untouchables fought longer for their right to enter in temples. But Ayengali did not take serious interest in the Temple Henry agitation, for example. For, for him, Dalits was not to be benefited by the Temple Henry Proclamation. This is what he said. Ayengali said, I quote, We don't need a God who keeps silent while we are beaten up by the upper caste from time immemorial. Unquote. So the Temple Henry movement, in fact, did not make significant change in for the Dalit. These words of Ayengali show the attitude of the lower caste towards Temple Henry. In 1936, the formation of the Communist Party in Kerala, a series of personal struggles were started under their leadership. And in 1957, the left ministry came for the first time in Kerala government through democratic methods. Series of landmark legislations, including the Education Bill and the Land Reform Bill, 
which has been hailed as a revolutionary act. But what is happening still is the education scenario is still being controlled by private religious institutions and they have an upper hand. Even now, we, the government could not control their activities. Land reform, which is often hailed as a radical or revolutionary reform, has made the Dalits and Adivasis even now landless. Kerala has been ruled by left and right alliance ever since 1957. Now let me turn back before I conclude to the 19th century reform movements and the loopholes or contradictions or paradoxes in the Kerala society. There were two streams in the 19th century reform movement. If we trace Kerala's social political history to the 19th century, we were presented with double phase. There were internal reforms by upper caste Nambudaris, for example, VT Bhattaripad, NSS, and the other eligible, other backward communities. They consolidated their community as a result of the reformation movement. And it is these communities, the Nambudaris, the Nayas, and the Edavas, who shared the benefit of the reform movements, including the land reform movements. The other movement, the other stream was Dalit-led stream. It was marked by anti-caste desire for equality, justice, and rights, and for freedom. While at the turn of the century, 20th century, reformation helped the consolidation of the community identity and modernization of the upper caste, and the cream of the OBZs, other backward communities, especially the Eravas, it precluded the same in the case of Delhi's or lower caste. When many similar caste collectivities with different caste names grouped under the umbrella term Nair and Erava and consolidated their power, the Dalits remain fragmented as caste and subcaste. At a later stage in Kerala's history, the elite communities and caste, which had earlier consolidated, consolidated their position through identity politics, transformed their accumulated energies into nation-building politics and class politics. I quote from my own introduction to the Oxford Anthology of the Lit Writing. Kerala Reformation is often described as Hindu Reformation. For instance, Dr. T. M. Yeshudasan says thus, I quote from him, It was the renaissance, the depressed sessions of society to which 20th century started. The tensions between Western missionary activities and reactions of Hindu reformative movements towards missionaries together constituted the dialectical energy to the subaltern rising. Coming back to the Kerala culture before I conclude, let me say that the performative tradition of Kerala is now marked by the dominant cultural expressions. Ever since the emigration and consolidation of the Nambodris to Kerala, ever since the temple-centered administration, classical arts like Mohiniyatam, Bharatanatyam, Krishnanatyam or Kudiyatam were patronized and encouraged by the ruling classes. This was challenged by the lower caste and they had their own cultural expressions and performing arts. The Sudras, the Dalits, for example, Kunjan Nambiar introduced Tulal, another art form, which contested the Brahminic supremacy. Kutu was another untouchable art form. Porata, as I already explained in my previous lecture, Theyam, all these are counter cultural performances which challenge the hegemony of the upper caste. Caste still occupies the major factor determining a Keralite's social and cultural identity. Political parties utilize various castes and communities to attain power and maintain it. Dalits are still in colonies as subsidized bodies. 
worse are the case of Adivasis, the tribal people. They are displaced, denied of land rights, even the right to gather minor products from forests. They are struggling for survival. They have threat to their own livelihood. Their identity has been questioned. They are prey to the process of acculturation and mainstreaming. After independence, the mainstreaming and mainstream development agendas and the bureaucracy made the position of untouchable worse. The present position of Kerala social and cultural position is that the Hindu Brahmanic domination in the, in the entire field, the field of education, the field of politics, and the field of cultural expressions. The society still is full of superstitions, human gods, irrationality prevails, intolerance prevails in terms of plurality of cultures. And this is how we look back to our own social cultural history. Thank you very much.